Hello and welcome to the Over and Back Classic NBA Podcast. I am Jason, and with me as usual is Rich. Hello, Rich. What's going on, Jason? Not a whole lot. You know, I'm just um, thinking about things that I have done for an extremely long time, like this podcast. We have right. <laughs> done this podcast for, gosh, going on five years now? Is that is it uh, really? Uh, Holy that crap. That sounds about right. Wow. Yeah. Is, that, is that true? Uh, that, that, someone will check that. For, <laughs> I don't know if that's wrong. true. We'll go with yeah. it. I like it. It's got a nice yeah. ring to it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Maybe four years. Either way, it's been a long, it's been a, <laughs> you know, it, it feels like five years. If that's good or not, I don't know. Oh, I'm so you sorry. Know. I didn't know that was such a, you know, such a drain on your life, Jason. I'm sorry. I'll, you know, <laughs> Take I'll a whole year out, out of my <laughs> life. <laughs> I'll just yes. see myself out there. All right. Oh. All right. I guess that podcast is done. Thanks yeah, for so listening, Yeah, so great everybody. episode. Yeah, no. good stuff. Yeah. So I'll talk about the Spotify or whatever. We're on Spotify. Yeah. Go there. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> Leave us a review. No. Um, yeah, so we are uh, – that's a f- fun segue into uh, – <laughs> we're going to talk about the longest tenures that uh, any NBA player has had with one franchise. And we're going to talk about guys who spent their entire career with a franchise, guys who were on one team for an extremely long time and then just – danced around with it you know, got divorced and just you know fluttered about with it, a, bunch, a bunch of other teams you know toward the end of their career uh so yeah i some interesting uh discussion i believe will come out of uh will come out of this and this was you know sparked by a you know, pretty what is kind of a, a momentous event in nba history yeah, and that's uh, you know this offseason, Dirk Nowitzki uh, officially signed a one-year deal to uh, remain with the Dallas Mavericks. So, barring you know any sort of catastrophe uh, during preseason, uh, that he will play his twenty-first season with the Mavericks, which will be the most all-time uh, for a player with one franchise. And then also barring him just randomly deciding to like join the Grizzlies or something next year, uh, that will. Uh, and he seems to indicate that this is it, and this is his last year, and this is his final year with the Mavericks. So uh, this will be it for Dirk. But yeah, this will break the record then for twenty-one years. Also, start out with Dirk, of course, uh, with one franchise so 21 years with uh the mavericks uh at this point he's the franchise leader in games minutes played field goals field goal attempts three pointers free throws offensive rebounds defensive rebounds blocks points pr win shares and valuable replacement players so yeah dirk uh definitely sets uh the standards for the dallas mavericks franchise and will go down in and it'll be very difficult for anybody to eclipse what, what dirk has done with the dallas mavericks i don't know if it'll ever be done it'll be it'll take another in, insanely monumental season or a monumental career to even touch uh what dirk has done with the mavericks of course getting them to their first you know prolonged amount of you know you know success first prolonged amount of playoff success and obviously a championship i mean that's dirk's just the dallas mavericks i mean he's synonymous with the dallas mavericks now uh, absolutely yeah um right and he was you know when he came to the franchise, I mean, they'd obviously had some really good players. You know, they had they had Derek Harper, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Mark Aguirre. They had um, you know some really good players in the '80s and '90s. But um, you know, he w- there was absolutely an opportunity for someone to come in and cement themselves as the great player of the franchise. And yeah, I, it is highly, highly, highly unlikely that everyone anyone is ever going to be able to eclipse what he's done for that team. I, mean, I, I think he's he's pretty much uh, he, he is the Mavericks icon and there's pretty much no knocking him off the perch barring, you know, something exceptional happening. So Yeah, and the thing that was kind of interesting about him too is it was tough to find any even instance where it was like Dirk was maybe going to leave or it was rumored in trades or whatnot. It felt like pretty much from like 2005 he was pretty much locked into that team and it was never ever going to really change and obviously the success and the MVPs and the championship and stuff kind of locked him in for good but yeah, it was tough to find any sort of example of Dirk, you know, maybe not being there for the long haul or, you know, even after his rookie year where, where there were some up and downs or whatnot, it seemed like they were pretty confident in sticking with him. So, yeah, he's unique in this. We're going to talk about some guys here and there that that did, you know, there were rumors possibly of them moving out and doing other places, but it was nearly impossible to find anything of Dirk other than just unsubstantiated rumors of Dirk going anywhere else. It's almost been no contest that he was just going to go to the Mavericks every single year. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, I just want to mention that uh, Dirk and uh, and presumably Vince Carter again, with if, as long as there's no uh, shenanigans during training camp, will become uh, the, the next two players to play 21 seasons in the league, joining Robert Parrish, Kevin Willis, and uh, Kevin Garnett. And of course, all of those players have uh, played for uh, uh, several teams, including uh, Willis has played for eight teams, and uh, and Carter will be joining his eight teams when he uh, when he plays for the Hawks. Uh, so, oh God, uh, I forgot he's with the Hawks. <laughs> God damn it. Yes. 
<laughs> hey, oh. now let's, well, let's not I mean, come on. <laughs> you play the strings out in Atlanta with the Hawks. Oh, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, they're in the Kings. I mean, come uh, on. You're, you're little, right. Okay. There's <laughs> a little more to do than that. All that right. is the, that is, if nothing, that is the Atlanta Hawks slogan this year is, hey, at least it's not the Kings, Better right? Than the Kings? Hey, yeah. The Kings. yeah. <laughs> more dignity than the Kings. I think that's, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like so. that. The dignity and put the little, you know, put a little crown on the D there. That'd be pretty good. There you the, go. The that's Hawks good. just to yeah. troll the Sacramento Kings for no reason whatsoever. Yes. Uh, our next guy here, just one year off from Dirk. Uh, this will be the guy that Dirk is beating uh, the record for is Kobe Bryant. So a lot of recent guys in history. Kobe Bryant, uh, of course, with the Los Angeles Lakers. He's a franchise leader in games, minutes played, field goals, three-pointers, free throws, steals, points, uses percentage, of course, uh, and win shares. But uh, yeah, Kobe was an interesting case because there was a time, you know, 2006, 2007, 2008, where it looked like he might be on the way out. And there's the famous, you know, trade rumor and the, the, the trade request that Kobe made. So there is a real possibility that Kobe would not have been able to get, you know, another 10 years that he did with the Lakers. But uh, other than that, like, you know, weird moment in the trade request, uh, you know, in the, in the mid two thousands, pretty much he had been a Laker then almost from from you know a, after you know they, the success had come back with with, with Paul Gasol and, and Lamar Odom and they won their titles or whatever. Felt like Kobe was just going to stay there forever then. Uh, but yeah, it, it there was a time where where Kobe you know was really rumored to go on there and apparently uh, according to him made a pretty strong trade request to to leave uh, the Lakers. So it'd have been interesting to see how history would have uh, played that out uh, if he were to leave. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, it was I mean, there was video of him, uh, you know, going and saying basically, you know, trade Andrew Bonham, trade his ass. I, I believe was the uh, phrase for, <laughs> yeah. for Jason Kidd. So, yeah. So that was very. It, it's kind of been glossed over a little bit because, of, of course, you know, they got Gasol and had the success they had in the, at the end of the decade. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that was definitely looked like that was gonna you know end very poorly, and uh, he wasn't gonna necessarily be with the Lakers for his entire career. But I'm, you know, it, it worked out very well. Uh, um, both in basketball terms and especially in, um, you know, uh, f- financial terms for like, yes, <laughs> of a better way to put it, you know, um, interesting that Dirk and Kobe, uh, both were not drafted by their original teams, you right. know, yeah. Dirk, Dirk drafted by the Bucks and Kobe drafted by the Hornets. So, uh, so there's no one as, uh, you know, someone still has the opportunity to, uh, be drafted, uh, by their original team and stay with their original team for, uh, you know, more than 20 seasons. Uh, you know, if someone wants to take that challenge, maybe at some point that'll happen, but Mike Conley, we're looking your way. We're going to talk about Mike Conley here in a little bit. It's there you unbelievable go. that yeah. we're talking about Mike Conley, but we are going to talk about yeah. Mike Conley later. So, uh, I mean, I mean Dennis Haslam, I think obviously. Well, well, he wasn't drafted, so I guess that doesn't count. But uh, oh maybe, darn! Well, maybe yeah. he could. Maybe he could last last six more years. Uh, that's possible. <laughs> that's, please, dear God, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So next on our list, John Stockton here. Nineteenth season with the Utah Jazz, just one away from Jason's uh, record, as you mentioned there a little bit. Uh, Stockton's an interesting case because uh, his draft was, you know, 1984, the very famous 1984 draft. He was not a really resounding. I mean, people really didn't love. That they drafted him in Utah. There, there was a uh, uh, there's a newspaper report from June nineteenth, nineteen eighty four, that talks about the fact that the Jazz they gathered a bunch of fans at the Salt Palace for the draft party, and they announced Gonzaga guard, you know, John Stockton. And then th- this quote says there was no booze, no cheers, nothing. Nobody knew what to make of this guy. Nobody was really upset, but nobody was happy. It just felt like ah, John Stockton, really. And it, it's funny is there was a uh, I don't know the name in front of me, but there was a Gonzaga teammate that everybody wanted more than John Stockton, and for some reason that everybody was kind of perplexed that that the Jazz and oh, other teams picked, you know, or were on Stockton and not uh, this other Gonzaga teammate. But it's pretty interesting to see uh, how the no beers, uh, no booze, no cheers, nothing ended up with a you know a 19 career and a legendary career uh, with Utah Jazz for uh, for John Stockton. Yeah, and that's you know he did so much for the team. Obviously, along with Carl Malone, who um, uh, you know uh, almost made this list as well. Um, Obviously, the, <laughs> we'll the, the longevity that, yeah. part. Yeah, we'll talk about that coming up. But but yeah, he. Um, yeah, I, I didn't realize that the um, announcement um, that he, he got that reaction from you know the the draft. And, and yeah, it's it's kind of a weird one because yeah, the, the fact that it was nothing, the fact that it was just that people didn't know what to make of it. It wasn't like they were actively booing this guy or you know maybe that's it was a little bit of a different attitude with fans back then and, and probably. Obviously, Gonzaga not was well known um, as it is today as a uh, as a basketball school, but um, but yeah, that that's uh, that's sort of a strange one. And, and you know, there really was never a time again where Stockton, you know, even had any kind of um, you know even thought about leaving. Really, I mean, even in '96, he said, you know, I'm not leaving Utah. Uh, you know, um, and he says he's staying there. He likes it there. Uh, he says if that turns around and bites me, that's that's the way it goes. He doesn't want to, you know, just wanted to wanted to stay there. Was happy there. Was was comfort there. And that, that's cool. I think. I mean, 
like I don't think team players should be obligated in any way to stay with the team that drafted them if they have other situations and want to go someplace else or you know or whatever. Um, but I do think it's cool when the situation works out for both the player and the team for them to be able to be there for their entire career. I mean, it is a relatively you know rare thing for it to you know happen. You know, more than fifteen plus years, there's only a handful of guys on this list who are able to you know spend that much time with the team, or e- even more so, spend you know their entire career with with uh, on one on one franchise. So that that means a lot. Yeah, it does, and it, it, it's it's cool too because we're gonna you know a lot of the names we're gonna talk about here. Obviously, for playing in the league as many years as they do, they're gonna be you know top top tier players. But these guys are the guys we're gonna talk about are almost iconic with those franchises. Dirk is synonymous with the Mavericks, and that's cool that you know there's that way. John Stockton is synonymous with the Jazz, and in a lot of ways, and we'll talk about a few other guys here a little bit who are just synonymous with these franchises for staying there so long. And yeah, you know I'm I'm all for players doing whatever they can to get the most money and maximize their value or whatever. But if a guy is totally cool with just saying, hey, you know what, I'll 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 sign there because this is comfortable for me. I like it here. Everything's doing well, and it doesn't, as as you know, Stockton says. And this is nineteen ninety six. He says, "Well, if it bites me in the ass, you know what? What it, you know? So what? You know that is what it is." But then they go to you know two straight NBA finals, so it's actually the opposite. It ends up being his most successful a few years as well. But I thought it was kind of funny too is that Stockton uh, did not have an agent as well. He had David Falk initially, who was obviously the, the super agent of the time, uh, David Falk, and Stockton just you know let him go and just kind of negotiate on his own from that. And I was like, no, nah, I don't need it. It's fine. It's cool. You know, like uh, you know, it says in in one quotes, you know, it'd be kind of a joke for me to say, yeah, I'm going to check my options. I'm not. To me, that's lying. For me to say, I'd go play somewhere else would be a lie so why do it so it's kind of interesting there that he just never did it and also uh, 1996 uh, he agreed to a deal that made uh, salary cap space available so the team could improve and obviously they did improve uh, the next two seasons in exchange though hard negotiator John Stockton insisted insisted that Delta Center ice time be made for his son's hockey team though so you know really John oh, Stockton go. swinging a big stick there you know you're, yeah. gonna, you're, you're gonna pay Driving me less, hard but it. gosh darn it you're gonna yeah. give ice time to my son's hockey team so yeah he probably also said gosh darn it too, which is the good part as well. He probably uh, did. He, he probably did, yeah. <laughs> as far as Stockton, franchise leader in sounds... games, three-pointers, assists, steals, offensive win shares, and win shares per 48 for, J- uh, for John Stockton on the Jazz. So we'll move on now to 19 seasons as well. This is Tim Duncan, uh, San Antonio Spurs, of course. Uh, really hope he could have made it to 20. That would have been pretty fun. He would have also got a record, but... Alas, it did not happen. Um, of course, with Tim Duncan, the famous thing is in 2000, he almost left. The quotes uh, from Tim Duncan is, is he said, you know, point blank, I came real close to leaving. You know, I came close to leaving real close. Uh, there, of course, was the a goal to form a super team in Orlando with Tim Duncan, Grant Hill, and Tracy McGrady. Uh, Coach Doc Rivers famously had a rule where significant others could not be on the planes. And that was the rumor deal breaker for Duncan and his family. So immediately after that, when Duncan kind of had cold feet about this situation, was then sort of thinking of his other options. Uh, David Robinson, who was vacationing in Hawaii, cut that short, met up with Greg Popovich. They go to the Virgin Islands, and then they consider, uh, or they convinced Tim Duncan, I should say, uh, to stay with the San Antonio Spurs. And that was probably a good pick because then, of course, he makes 19 seasons with the Spurs, uh, becomes the franchise leader in games, minutes played, field goals, uh, offensive rebounds, defensive rebounds, blocks, points, offensive win shares, defensive win shares, win shares, value replacement player basically everything you know tim duncan yeah. becomes the spurs in a lot of ways but yeah it this it would have been a fascinating to see after three or four years tim duncan just bouncing and going to orlando like it's just amazing to figure out or try to understand maybe what his you know what, what would the career of tim duncan be if he didn't have the sort of identity that he has with the spurs and if he didn't have the success you know the spurs obviously he would have already won a title with them but then going to orlando and doing whatever it was there that those guys would do uh, just fascinating to think of how different his career would be you know sort of perceived yeah, and how successful the Magic would have been with those three guys. I mean, obviously, Hill would have dealt with all his injuries, uh, but Duncan McGrady would still have been a great uh, pair together. But that there, yeah, so many what ifs on that, and whether you know he would have been able to. Obviously, he wouldn't have had twenty years, but he would have had you know, maybe like fifteen, sixteen years with the Magic, and that's still a pretty impressive. Um, you, you know, run, you know, one, wondering how much this they would have been able to have. And yeah, lots of things there. Probably, probably turned out better the way that it uh, turned out. Obviously, you know, Duncan winning four championships uh, in addition to the first one that he'd won in 99 with the um, Spurs and, you know, all the great accomplishments that he um, had there. And, you know, again, basically, um, you know, Robinson was really the icon of the uh, team, I guess, George Griffin before that. But uh, you immediately, Duncan pretty much, you know, put his mark on that. It's, I, I think, definitely the first person people think of when they think of the Spurs. Yes. Definitely not quite Leonard. <laughs> Maybe right now they think no. quite well, well, Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. later, yeah. not so much. Uh, yeah. Move on now to uh, Reggie Miller and the Indiana Pacers, uh, of course. 
Uh, Reggie Miller does 18 seasons with the Pacers, but famously was courted by the Knicks in 1996. And there's some some interesting ideas about that courting, if it was Reggie Miller just kind of using the Knicks' as leverage to get more money from the Pacers, if there was real interest in there. Uh, Miller's agent, who, I mean, of course, maybe not the most impartial <laughs> judge here, but Aaron Tellum said that Reggie's interest in the Knicks is sincere. This is a quote from the time. It says, Reggie's interest in the Knicks is sincere, and if the Knicks are sincere, there's a good chance we could work something out. I don't know what the Knicks will offer or what the Pistons will offer. We'll find out probably on Tuesday. And of course, as I mentioned, there's sort of that weird idea if there was going to be leverage. Is he just trying to get more money from Indiana? Uh, there was rumors at the time, if you read articles, that they were between two guys in the Knicks. They were between Allen Houston and Reggie Miller. Uh, they, of course, chose Allen Houston, which at the time makes, I, I think, makes pretty good sense. Allen Houston on the rise. And Allen Houston had some great years with the Knicks as well. Uh, and Reggie, you know, was still solid and would still have quite a few more years uh, under his belt. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with the idea of choosing Allen Houston over uh, Reggie Miller. But yeah, where, where do you stand on the Reggie Miller to the Knicks thing in 1990? six was it a, a real thing what would have what would that have been like either that just feels icky. yeah i don't like that, that. i don't like no it that is that's really really hard to imagine because you know i mean a lot of people feel that way about durant going to golden state you know from oklahoma city because they were you know playoff rivals and so forth but yeah i mean it was a lot more personal with the pacers and knicks uh and obviously that, that was added to later on in the 90s as well it wasn't it had already started but it was you know far from concluding you know they played four or five years in a row in the playoffs. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that I can see at the time picking Houston over Reggie because Houston was, was younger and, you know, had maybe looked like he might be more of a star. But I, I don't know. I, I mean, I would have uh, – I think Miller was the – it's obviously the better player at the time, and you know if if you can get you if you can just you know, get a guy like that, and get a guy who delivers in like big moments like that, and um, do that, I you know yeah I, I think that would have uh, yeah it, it's just you're right it, it is really weird to think about though it's really yeah, remarkably I don't like hard. I just like yeah. thinking of Reggie in the Knicks jersey like yeah. high fiving right. Spike Lee. It's but, like, no, that's a nap at all. Yeah. Like, but who would have known that Reggie would still be, you know, pretty good in like oh four and oh five? Right. Know, like yeah, I would have never that, that long. That. Yeah, you you would you think maybe he would have like four, you know, good years left. But yeah, he had like eight good years left. So yeah. And of course Reggie Miller, franchise leader in games, minutes played, field goals, three pointers, free throws, assists, steals, points. Offensive win shares, defensive win shares, win shares altogether. Bad or replacement players. So he's definitely pretty good. The th- he is not, though, the Pacers all time leader in win shares per 48. That is, as everybody would guess, Brad Miller, of course. Yes. <laughs> you know, Pacers legend. It's Brad gotta Miller. be Miller. <laughs> of yeah. course. Yeah. Right. That's, that I don't even, I, I was barely even going to mention that because you all know that at home. And Jason, I know you know that off the top of your head. Sure. That Brad Miller yeah. is the Indiana Pacers, you know, win shares per 48 leader. But uh, just thought I'd mention it for the few folks out there that don't remember that. So, yeah. Uh, move good. on now uh, to uh, one that's still present, sort of, kind of, Manu Ginobili with the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, he is entering his 16th season. Um, him, interestingly enough, in uh, 2016 offseason, the Sixers, a lot of people remember this as well, made a huge offer to Ginobili, who was 38 at the time. A big offer. Uh, they um, guaranteed him a two-year deal that would have been uh, the, with the first year between 16 and $17 million. He ended up taking a much reduced deal to stick with the Spurs, but it would have been fascinating to see Manu Ginobili with kind of the not quite up and coming. They were sort of kind of on the cusp of it a little bit with the, the Sixers. Like you could feel it was it was on the way there with the Sixers. Obviously, this would not be you know until next year when we really saw them emerge to the level that they did. But uh, yeah, fascinating to think of Manu Ginobili yucking it up with like the the baby Sixers and Joel Embiid and all that sort of stuff. It seems it just suddenly seems kind of interesting that, that he would do that but uh, what are your thoughts on on manu uh, almost going to the sixers yeah that would have been uh you that would have made them even more, i think more fun although they were you know that would have been more fun if they if he had gotten there this year with that team because the team was, was kind of enjoyable and obviously they're emerging and all of that but mm-hmm. yeah i, I mean it, it's going to be similar and we'll probably deal with it a little bit with tony parker going to the hornets i mean that's just gonna feel yeah. like a completely like odd strange thing and i think ginobili being on another franchise as well it is going to just be um that that one's going to be hard to to process a little bit yeah so i i think um yeah even though i like there's part of me could imagine actually being fun especially with ginobili being on the sixers themselves and you know mi- mixing with those personalities and with that style and everything and you know, uh, throwing great passes to um, to Embiid or you know Ben Simmons or whatever, but 
but yeah, it's uh, I, I think I have enough sentimentality that I, I'm, I'm happy to see him on the uh, Spurs. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, he's 16 years right now, as you said. He got drafted in 1999, uh, did not come to the NBA until 2002. I don't think he's going to reach 20 years. <laughs> that would be, no, uh, no, it's already think. looking kind of bleak there for old man who's so, yeah, I don't think he's got four more years, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll see. I, I, I don't think so, though. Uh, move on now to John Havlicek for the Boston Celtics. Of course, this is 1962 to 1978, so 16 straight years with the Celtics. A uh, franchise leader in games, minutes played, field goals, and points. Uh, most of the counting stats, you know, you'll see John Havlicek up at near the leaderboards for, for Celtics all time, but very few of the value and advanced stats. Uh, those are occupied by guys we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, what do you make of John Havlicek and where he sort of ranks um, with the Boston Celtics all time uh, in, in terms of those games played? And, and obviously having the most of any uh, Celtic as well, most consecutive years or most overall years with the Celtics, I should say. Right. It's, it's interesting, Havlicek, because I think like. When he retired, he had a very vaulted place in Celtics and NBA history. I mean, there was that retirement tour that celebrate, you know, that celebrated his career. He had, had played more games than anybody in NBA history. He, I, I think, he was in the top five or definitely in the top ten in you know points scored and all that. And as you mentioned, yeah, it was more. A lot of it was accumulation more than efficiency. Although I think just the years that he kind of played and some of the strengths that he actually has, I, I think he's better than maybe some of that uh, says he is. But. Um, yeah, he's. I think he gets a little bit lost in the Boston Celtics shuffle. They have so many iconic players that um, you know, he get, he's you know he's behind Russell, he's behind Bird, um, and I and he's sort of sandwiched between those two. I mean, he's obviously part of that '60s era. Um, and he's right before that '80s era where he's sort of. Um, you know, maybe his best years were those '70s teams that were really great, but somehow get lost in the shuffle because of all the other great Celtics teams. So, I I, I think he's like, I think he should, if if he had played for just about any other franchise other than the maybe the Lakers and the um and the Celtics, I think he'd be the most important player in that team's history. But because he played for the Celtics and they have so many important players, and, be, be, and a little bit because of the time that he played, and also that he didn't have the most captivating personality and also that he didn't really stay with the game after he retired. All those things I think have made him less um, valued or appreciated or remembered than uh, maybe I think that he deserves. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned this guy a little bit earlier, Udonis Haslam, uh, 15 seasons right now with the Heat. Uh, went undrafted, so I don't know how we're going to clarify him there a little bit. But uh, yeah, Udonis Haslam, franchise leader in offensive rebounds and defensive rebounds, that's it. And I don't think he's probably going to collect anymore. Maybe all-time games and stuff you can you yeah. can sort of contend with, but he also has to get into these games for that account. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Udonis Haslam, well, it's hard to believe it's been 15 years of Udonis Haslam in the Heat. And he's he's seen so much, <laughs> too, with that franchise. I mean, think about that. Like, 2003 to now, I mean, that's like the end of the morning era, the Dwayne Wade and Shaq era. He sees the big three era. He sees the, of course, the James Johnson era. You know, like, it's just like just the different things, and it's all the constant is Udonis Haslam. It's just uh, it's pretty amazing. It is, yeah. He's the first non Hall of Famer on this on this list. Um, you know, really, you have to go down pretty far before you get to. Well, I guess there's one other one who's not a Hall of Famer that we'll get to. But yeah, it, it's interesting that we're that right now we have, we have two of those guys who are very much like just yeah for whatever reason they stuck around with those teams were part of those cultures even though you know they were good basketball players in their at their oh, peaks, sure. yeah, but yeah. they just more just have been around there have just kind of st- stuck around there for you know rather than um you know before those two everyone else who had played 15 more y- years with the team was you know, a bona fide hall of famer you know one of the, one of the best players in their franchise's history yeah and then yeah so we'll, there's a guy here in a little bit that we'll talk about for sure that definitely uh definitely sticks out like a sore thumb but this man does not Dolph Shays uh with the Syracuse Nationals Philadelphia 76ers uh he goes 15 years with that franchise of course they move uh, uh along the way but uh still with the same franchise there drafted by the New York Knicks though which is interesting as well in 1948 uh opts to play for the Nationals in the NBL and then of course the Nationals moved to the NBL uh, or moved to the NBA um, in uh, 1949. So different stuff there. Uh, franchise yeah, merger, yeah, yeah. And uh, Dolce is a franchise leader in free throws, total rebounds, offensive win shares, defensive win shares, and win shares. So I ask, does that surprise you a little bit? Given that the Syracuse Nationals, the 76ers, have a really storied franchise history. I mean, a lot of really great players. We're going to mention them quite a few times, including the next guy we're going to talk about. Does it surprise you that Dolph Shays would be so high on the list for some of those? Um, I mean. Only because I've looked into it a little bit and, and, and know a, a bit of history. I mean, I think the thing with the uh, the Sixers' best players 
is that they didn't necessarily have a lot of longevity with the uh, franchise. I mean, Iverson obviously, you know, moved on after, you know, nine or 10 years, uh, you know, Irving, you know, his first uh, five years were in the ABA. So he only, he had, you know, uh, 11 or so years with them. Uh, you know, Wilt only had a relatively short stint with the uh, with the Sixers. So, you know, the, yeah, they've had a lot of great players during the time. Moses Malone, he was there four or five years. So, uh, but most of their you know, truly great best players, um, you know, don't quite have the longevity with the franchise that you know Shays and Greer have. Yeah, and that's that brings us right to our next one. It's Hal Greer there with uh, 15 years as well with the Syracuse Nationals, Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, he's the franchise leader in games, minutes played, field goals, and points. So he kind of fills out some of those other ones that Dolph Shays doesn't have. And I think, again, speaks to your point that, yeah, these guys might not always come, you know, one and two when you mention the best players in, in that franchise's history, but they were there for so long that some of these stats, particularly uh, accumulating win shares, accumulating games, minutes played, field goals, points, and that sort of stuff, will go to them a little bit more than it would a guy like a Will, to a guy like an Allen Iverson, even a guy like a, a Julius Irving, who we're going to talk about in a bit. But, uh, yeah, so Hal Greer, of course, leads in those ones there. And uh, definitely, yeah, very similar to, to Dolph Shays in that sense, where he plays 15 years uh, with the franchise, establishes a, a long career and a long tenure with that franchise. But, uh, yeah, pretty uh, pretty interesting to see Hal Greer uh, up towards the top of this list as well. Yeah, and Greer, you know, he's a guy who has, uh, you know, half a dozen or so, you know, second team all NBA players. I mean, he was yeah, absolutely a Hall of Famer, absolutely, you know, great in his day. And, and Shays was, you know, was one of the better, you know, probably top five player during, uh, you know, most of his career. I mean, he was definitely a guy who, you know, if you if you think about the contributions to the franchise and the longevity, if you add up all the case for him over, you know, even some of the other great players the Sixers have had, I, you know, I think you could you could make a case that he's one or two in terms of, you know, best, most important player uh, in the franchise history. Of course, you know, how we like to, uh, to discuss it, given, you know, the context of their times versus you know how they would fare now or whatever it's, like that and now we move on to the next guy who as you mentioned a little bit earlier kind of in the Udonis Haslam but I think less like <laughs> maybe less of a contributor than Udonis Haslam even Nick Collison from the Seattle Supersonics slash Oklahoma City Thunder yes he started with the Supersonics and is still hanging around here uh drafted by uh in 2003 he missed the entire season though his, his rookie season then came uh, into the league, but uh, he was 14 years with that franchise. I believe he finally now has ended that. I think the Nick Collison experience is over. We'll see uh, if he ends up getting re-signed or whatnot, but he leads the franchise in absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I think Collison did officially retire, and I, I believe there's uh, Haslam is negotiating for a return, so uh, Haslam will continue, but but Collison will uh, will be no longer. Yeah, um, you know, yeah, I think he and uh, Durant are the only. I, I think it might be Collison, Durant, and um, um, I, I think he may be retired now. But um, Gerald Wilkins, I believe those are the three remaining players who played for the Sonics in the NBA. If I'm uh, not mistaken. Oh yeah, I think that is true. Yeah, and we lose Collison now. Yeah, I think I think you're right. We did talk about that on, on an episode about a year or so ago, which which stinks. We need to keep the Sonics alive, but Durant will will actually sure. keep it on for for quite a while. But um, right. And we always have him, yeah, now that Collison has dropped out. But, yeah, we did talk about that. I don't have to clarify if that is the exact number, but I believe that is true. So Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Damien Wilkins. I, said, I think it's a Joe Wilkins, but I'm Damien Wilkins. <laughs> so. I like the idea of Gerald Wilkins still playing the yeah. NBA. It's like, hey, he might be 60. <laughs> he might be, like, 58 years old. But, gosh yeah. darn it, Gerald gives you a good effort every single time out there, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of Gerald Wilkins. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. Uh, move on now. 14 years as well uh, for Elgin Baylor with the Minneapolis and Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, he is the franchise leader in total rebounds and points per game. Not a ton for Elgin Baylor, but uh, yeah, pretty interesting there for 14 years for the Lakers. He is our highest ranking Lakers so far. Uh, we'll talk about another one here right after Elgin, but uh, yeah, Angel, Elgin Baylor with uh, 14 years uh, with the franchise. Uh, actually, tied. We'll, we'll move on to the next guy. I think it's pretty relevant to do that as well. Uh, with Jerry West, who also has 14 years with the Lakers. Uh, their timeline just about matches up. There's a few years here and there where they don't quite match up, but uh, this I thought was more fascinating, even more so than Elgin. I'll, I'll let you chime in on Elgin if you want, but I thought this one I was really caught me by surprise. Jerry West, 14 years with the Lakers, tied for the most overall with that franchise, only leads the franchise in offensive win shares. That is it. Does it feel like he should have more? Yeah. Does it feel like he should be more significant? Like, because he feels very significant with the Lakers, but that's it. Offensive win shares is all it has. Does that say more about the Lakers franchise, or what does it say about Jerry West? I don't know. I just found that kind of perplexing. Yeah, I think it, I think it says more about the. Um Lakers because you know, obviously Kareem was there 15 years and he has it, most of the offensive records I would imagine I mean well Kobe's passed of course a lot of them um but Kareem had them for a long time you know you have magic for assists um 
I, I think it's just again, it's it's all the great players that were there. And, and West, unlike um, uh, you know somebody like um, somebody like Havlicek, I don't think he gets lost in the shuffle as much. I mean, I think he's kind of appreciated for you know being the great player that he was at the time. You know, winning the Finals MVP, I think, was helpful, and I, I think even more helpful is just staying around in the game and his success as an executive has kept his uh, memory as a player alive. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, it slightly surprises me, I guess. But you know, when you think about who's been there, then it's not terribly surprising. Move on to uh, number another fourteen year uh, career as well. Joe Dumars, the Detroit Pistons, nineteen eighty five to nineteen ninety nine. I always forget he was hanging around until nineteen ninety nine for Joe Dumars. But uh, franchise leader in games, three pointers, and offensive win shares. He seems like he lasted even longer because he also just kind of moved very easily into the kind of the GM and the in the front office role. But uh, yeah, fourteen years for Joe Dumars leads in games, three pointers, and offensive win shares, and probably will lead in those for quite a while because Detroit seems to have trouble keeping any sort of <laughs> semblance of anything going in that franchise. Sure. But uh, yeah, Joe Dumars. Dumars, 14 years. Uh, any thoughts on Joe Dumars and his tenure with the Pistons? Yeah, I mean, he's one where, like, he was a really important player in franchise history, but he doesn't seem like he's the iconic player in franchise history. I mean, I guess it's Isaiah is the guy who I first think of when I think of, the, you know, absolutely the, you know, the dynamic, you know, most important player on this team. Although I, I think that's might say more about Dumars just kind of personality wise because you know, his encore value was incredible um you know maybe not quite what Isaiah's was but it was it was up there as well it was obviously he's a hall of famer so um you, you can definitely make the case of in terms of impact in terms of everything that he might be the most important player in French's history but to, for me like he he doesn't you know like when you think of him it's like eh, okay maybe but it's not like undisputed like some of the other guys who are kind of on this list uh, David Robinson, our last of the 14s. David Robinson with the San Antonio Spurs, of course. Uh, he's a little bit interesting case, too, because you, you could maybe have added a few more years there. Gets drafted in 1984, but, of course, can't uh, enter the NBA until 1989 because of his commitments to the Navy. Uh, but still gets 14 years there with Spurs. Franchise leader in free throws, PR, win shares per 48, and box plus minus. So a lot of the advanced stats kind of lean towards David Robinson, where a lot of the, obviously, counting stats uh, go towards the Tim Duncan, which, of course, you know, when he has six more years under his belt, um, or, 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 sorry, uh, five more years under his belt, you're obviously going to get that a little bit more with, with Duncan, but uh, Robinson still uh, makes his mark, and as we said earlier, and uh, you said earlier, uh, David Robinson really was the Spurs, and he felt like the face of the franchise until Tim Duncan came in there and kind of knocked the doors down and, and got them to even more success than they could maybe even ever imagine, but still, David Robinson uh, does create, an, and he's still in some ways an ambassador for the Spurs as well, so I think he's definitely established himself, still as a part of that, even if he's not maybe the highest ranking one, we have Manu and uh, uh, Duncan over Robinson, but I think Robinson still holds a little bit of a cachet as well, because he was the, the first guy of the, sort of the modern NBA era to get them to that next level, and a guy that, that people still remember a lot, and, and remember him for being synonymous with the Spurs. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely second to Duncan, but there's nothing wrong with that, he's still a remarkable career, and... Um and absolutely, you know, had, had a, as I was about, you know, he's the more, you know, more kind of personable one, you know, where Duncan's kind of more withdrawn, where Robinson's more out there and, you know, being the ambassador for the team and for the league. So I think he stands out because of uh, of that as well. Uh, Bill Russell, it's kind of interesting to see him here uh, a little bit later because, of course, he did not have that long of a career. 13 years with the Celtics, uh, drafted by the St. Louis Hawks in 1956, of course, immediately traded. Then we've talked about that trade many, many times. Uh, decent trade at the time for <laughs> both teams. It worked out a little bit better for one team, but at the time, a it, it justifiable trade. But, uh, yeah, 13 years for Bill Russell on the Celtics. Uh, he leads the franchise total rebounds, minutes per game, uh, rebounds per game, defensive win shares, and win shares. I mean, we've talked about Russell a lot. I don't know if there's anything more I have to talk about Bill Russell, but if you have anything, feel free. But if not, not, I'll move on to our next guy. Uh, yeah, I think we've said enough about Bill Russell on this uh, podcast that I'll. Uh, uh, Bill Russell was great. Yes. There you go. WrestleMania. So, listen to our WrestleMania listen, series. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Yes. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, so we have Bob Cousy listed here, but I, but Bob Cousy played seven games for the Royals, so I feel like he should not. Yeah, actually okay, I was wondering, should we take? I, I wanted to like ignore that he played for the Royals, but I guess we should. Uh, you know, because it was kind of a sham. Well, but I guess I yeah. guess we should take Bob Cousy out. You're right. Right. Yeah. Regardless, it it counts. So yeah. I feel you're like, right. Uh, you're right. You're right. It counts. Yeah. So Bob Cousy, yeah. you're gone. See you later, buddy. Yeah. Now we bye, move on bye, to bye, Satch Bob. Sanders, who uh, yes. was played for the Celtics for 13 years from 1960 to 1973, and leads the franchise in absolutely nothing because he was Satch no. Sanders, who had a good career, yeah. but obviously he's Satch Sanders. He's not going to be yeah. leading the team in anything because 
Right, which is fine. <laughs> yeah, he was yeah perfect for what he did. He was a great defensive forward. He, um, you know, really great guy from all accounts, and um, it was important to the team. But yeah, it was he, he was more along the lines of I think he was more Im- impactful on the court, but he was more along the lines of your Nick Collisons and your Dennis Haslam's. Like he was, he was there. He was important. He was great in his role. But yeah, he was n- not a star. Although he, people say at, when he played, he had the talent that he could have been a star. But you know, he just fit into all of the Celtics right, and. Right. And, and, and fit in that role they didn't need him to be that way and that just worked out that way so all right so we're going to kind of go a little bit quicker for some of these other guys as well so we can get to uh, some of the interesting stories of these but uh wes unseld uh, obviously with the bullets franchise for 13 years uh calvin murphy with the uh the houston rockets the san diego slash houston rockets uh, for 13 years as well fred brown with the seattle supersonics uh for 13 years alvin, Ad- alvin adams with the phoenix suns uh, for 13 years. I want to bring him up real quick because he is the franchise leader in games, minutes played, offensive rebounds, total rebounds, steals, and defensive win shares. And I wonder, you know, Alvin Adams is a guy that maybe I don't appreciate quite as much, but I think, does it reflect poorly on Phoenix that he's as high in those, or is that more of a credit to Alvin Adams? So I'm not trying to demean Alvin Adams at all. I just think it's kind of surprising. I did not expect him to be so high on all those leaderboards for Phoenix. Because Phoenix has had great players as well, but maybe just guys who haven't hung around uh, for nearly that much. So d- does him being at the top of those lists more reflect on Phoenix, or does it reflect on him, you think? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I, I think Adams was, was really, really good, excellent player. Um, but I, I think it's partly because Phoenix just, yeah, some of their great players did not have, the you know, had like six to eight, ten-year runs as opposed to 13-year runs. I mean, you know, Nash or um, Charles Barkley or, or guys like that, you know, even Paul Westfall, you know, didn't have the super longest run for that uh, team. You know, even Kevin Johnson was, I think, nine nine ten years or so so um I, yeah i think it's just kind of more circumstance than anything but you I mean Ad, adam's another guy who's definitely uh really fun to watch really great uh you know kind of all do everything type player you know good passing big man all that kind of stuff um you know, he, he's he's a we talked about him a little bit before uh, here and there but he's he's a fun guy to watch for sure yeah he's a guy that i'm definitely after after doing this episode and after doing some research i want to check out a little bit more of just because I, I guess i did not realize how you know important he was that that franchise so definitely gonna check him out a little bit more i um, move on to the next guy 13 years for larry bird now larry bird of course i have to tell you about his celtics career you know about that but i think the fun thing about larry bird is that the long rumored trade to indiana in 1988 and this has been i think corroborated by red auerbach and he has mentioned it uh, many times before as well i don't know if they were ever actually going to do this deal or whatnot i it, it, it's very weird but uh in 1988 the indiana pacers offered chuck person herb williams and steve stepanovich for larry bird so what that would have just been really weird to have Larry Bird on the '88, you know, Indiana Pacers, and it's a weird trade too because Chuck Person, Herb Williams, and Steve Sabanovich. I mean, guys that were were solid, and Chuck Person would obviously have a pretty solid career. Uh, but yeah, you wonder, you know, what would have happened because Bird still had some solid years in him uh, in Indiana. It would have been fascinating to see that team sort of maybe emerge uh, in the final few years of Bird. Yeah, that would have really been interesting. Um... It's hard to even imagine it because, um, uh, yeah, you're, the Celtics were a still a very competitive, very good team mm-hmm. from '89, you know, on, but they were no longer championship contenders, so it wouldn't have necessarily like shifted like you know anything, you know, who went to the finals or, or what have you. I mean, I, I don't, I, I kind of doubt that Bird would have been enough. I don't think. The Pacers were really set to, uh, you know, go over the top or anything. I mean, I guess Bird and Reggie being on the same team would have been it's just sort of an interesting thought exercise. But, you know, I, I don't think they had enough to really be, you know, a deep playoff team with Bird. Bird probably would have been, you know, better off with the Celtics in terms of yeah. know, staying competitive. But, um, but yeah, I mean, in, in one one sense, it wouldn't have changed a lot. In one sense, it would have changed everything. So. Yeah, for sure. Uh, next guy, Magic Johnson, uh, also 13 years, so exactly the same amount as Magic John- as, as Larry Bird. Of course, we're adding that 1986 season as well where he comes back out of retirement, so that definitely helps Magic. Uh, as far as him, of course, he's synonymous with the Lakers now and forever, uh, but there was a time, and we have an entire episode about this as well, so we definitely recommend you check this out. I believe it is just called When Magic Johnson Requested a Trade. Uh, and yeah, Magic Johnson Requested a Trade. Wanted to get out of L.A., was sick of uh, a lot of the stuff going on there. We go into details uh, on that episode, so definitely want to check that out if you get a chance. But yeah, almost uh, almost moved on and almost went somewhere else, which just seems weird because he's just so synonymous with that franchise now. But yeah, there's a real possibility that a few years into his career, he's out and he's on another team and with another franchise. Yeah, and that's just that's a weird thing to think about for sure. All right, so we have Kevin McHale. Uh, he had 13 years as well with the Boston Celtics. Uh, real quickly, he was also the same year that that Bird deal was floated around. Apparently, Red was trying to get uh, Kevin McHale to Dallas. The rumored deal was... Uh 
Kevin McHale going to the Dallas Mavericks for Detlef Schrempf and Sam Perkins, which is a hell of a haul. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, those are two guys that, that would end up having, I mean, maybe not, you know, obviously for the Mavericks, but end up having some pretty prolonged careers. Uh, and those guys would, you know, sort of pop up again on the Pacers many, many years later. But uh, yeah, Kevin McHale uh, going to the Dallas Mavericks just seems weird and icky in 1988. And he was, you know, really kind of at the end of his rope for, for the most part at that time. But still, it would have been fascinating to see that more than anything, just to see Detlef Schrempf and Sam Perkins on the Celtics, because that would have been really cool. That would have maybe, you know, had they kept Bird and acquired those two guys. That almost would have worked. Like, so if there was any of those two deals, like I almost would take that one. And, and yeah, obviously, Kevin McHale played an important role. But I mean, you had Bird and what was left of Bird to a core when you had Detlef Schrempf and Sam Perkins and those sort of guys. That would have been really fun to see. But uh, alas, did not happen. Yeah, McHale has a lot of injuries toward the end too. I mean, he was he was hobbled by that you know, after the uh, the broken ankle in '87 and playing on that. So yeah, that 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 one I could see shifting the. Um, Celtics up a little bit, you know, whether they could have actually beaten the Pistons or the, especially the Bulls, it, that, that's an interesting question. But yeah, that, that I, I can see maybe shifting some, you know, competitive, uh, shifting some series and, you know, making the Celtics more competitive deeper into the playoffs. Definitely. Uh, Isaiah Thomas, Detroit Pistons, 13 years there. Uh, of course, we could not go this episode without talking about Jeff Foster, Indiana Pacers legend. As well, you know, there's Brad Miller, who we mentioned earlier. There's also Jeff Foster, Indiana Pacers legend. 13 years for Jeff Foster in Indiana. He's the franchise leader in uh, offensive rebound percentage and also being an annoying dickhead. He uh, definitely <laughs> led the league many, many years in being an annoying dickhead, Jeff Foster. But uh, yeah, yeah the, Jeff Foster, 13 years in Indiana. I. You, I could, you could have put a gun to my head and asked me how many years did Jeff Foster play in Indiana, and I would have never got anywhere near thirteen. I would have said like six. I yeah. cannot believe he was there from nineteen ninety nine until two thousand twelve. Think of all that right. Jeff Foster saw, all the different eras of Indiana Pacers basketball that Jeff Foster right. lived through. It's just yeah. I mean, there's the Reggie Miller era. There's yeah, he the, made the finals era. His second year. Then he has you yeah. know, the Dallas in the Palace. He's got the right. emerging of Jermaine O'Neal. He has the the, the Danny Jamal- Granger era. Yeah, the Danny Granger, era. and then like the Roy Hibbert Paul George era, like. Right. Right, oh yeah, and all the constant yeah. and all of it is Jeff Foster yeah. for some reason. <laughs> there you go. I I would never have expected this talking about <laughs> Jeff Foster that's... here so much, but yeah, it's uh, uh, yeah. God, there was that team where it was him and Hansbro and oh God, I hated that team. So oh yeah, much. you know the team. Mike Dunleavy was in that team, oh, right? My God, yeah. yeah. When Mike Dunleavy is like your fourth most annoying guy in your team, you've really yeah. like you've really assembled quite the unit there. But uh, that was the. Uh, for the Indiana Pacers, but uh, oh, run through boy. these other guys here a little bit. Sam Jones for the Boston Celtics, he has 12 years. Michael Cooper, 12 years. Neither of these guys are franchise leaders in any respect. For the most part, we're going to kind of get, we're kind of done with a lot of the franchise leaders. Well, there's some other guys that will pop up, but we're starting to just kind of get guys uh, that hung around for a while. Good players, of course. We're talking about, you know, Michael Cooper and a James Worthy and a Sam Jones, guys that were decent role players, but just not, you know, franchise bests in, in, in any ways. Uh, Nate McMillan with the Seattle Supersonics for 12 years as well. Rick Smith's 12 years on the Indiana Pacers. Uh, we mentioned this guy as well. Active player Mike Conley, 11 years on the Memphis Grizzlies. And given the money that he's getting paid, I don't think he has any reason uh, to leave right away. But I cannot imagine that Michael Conley gets to like 20 years of the Grizzlies. But who knows? Maybe. <laughs> uh, it's hard to imagine. 15 seems like yeah, it seems kind of reasonable. But yeah, 20 years, I mean, that's that's... Obviously, only a handful of guys have gotten to that stage, yeah. So, and his body's um, already, I mean, you're already starting to see a lot of injuries from him, too. So it's like, that's the other part, too, right. is like, you have to last this long. You have to last with your franchise. Your franchise needs to want you. And you also have to just be healthy enough to play as well, which is just not easy to do for a lot of guys. Exactly, yeah. Uh, Bob Pettit, uh, we, uh, Milwaukee and St. Louis Hawks, of course, 11 years there, ends his career uh, pretty early, still in, kind of arguably in the peak of his career, but uh, ends there with 11. Jack Twyman with the uh, Rochester Cincinnati Royals for 11 years. L. Adels, 11 years with the uh, San Francisco Philadelphia Warriors. Uh, Rudy Tomjanovich, uh, 11 years with the San Diego Houston Rockets. Uh, and then Julius Irving, which is pretty interesting as well. So he, uh, of course, does 11 years with the Philadelphia 76ers. There's a bunch of weird stuff there where, of course, he was drafted by the Bucks and he went to the ABA. Went, so whatever you want to call it. But as far as with one NBA franchise, we're just counting the NBA, not the merger. He's 11 years there. But what was interesting is I did find this as well. Uh, June 21st, 1984, there was a blockbuster deal uh, rumor that would have brought Julius Irving to the Clippers. It fell through uh, when he uh, denied the trade. He refused to leave uh, Philadelphia. Uh, reporters say that, you, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting thing because, you know, the report is that the 76ers said that Irving could turn the deal down, but then uh, General Manager Pat Williams of the, the Philadelphia said there was you know no way we were going to trade him. So just kind of interesting how it was going to be, but the deal, according to the San Diego Union uh, and the San Diego Tribune, would have sent Irving, uh, the 76ers' first-round draft po- choice, which is Leon Wood, and future considerations to the Clippers in exchange for Terry Cummings and $1.5 million. So 
I don't know. That's uh, I don't know if in 1984 that'd be a good haul for Julius. But again, like he didn't. I guess that was kind of the end of his peak, peak. You know, because he'd be out by 1984. But yeah, uh, interesting there to see. Uh, Julius Irving was a Clipper. That would have been very, very depressing. <laughs> I would have not liked that. At yeah, all. no, that that would have karmically that would not have no. been good. That would just would have been bad for everybody. So I'm glad it didn't happen. Um, yeah, basketball wise, I mean the Sixers were still good for a couple more years, mm-hmm. and you know '86 they were actually really good. Just the Celtics were, were better. So um, yeah, I don't know how much that would have changed in terms of, uh, of of history, but just in terms of yeah, we don't want to we don't want to have to be that's icky. No, I don't want Donald Sterling good. ruining no. anything about Julius Irving. No, so even no, even no, though no, this no. was Dad Julius Irving at this point, still right. You know, yeah, no, no <laughs> it's still we, don't, we don't need that. Yeah, we don't, yeah. we don't we do not need that. So, right. uh, Mark Eaton, eleven years with Utah Jazz. Vern Mickelson, uh, ten years with the Minneapolis Lakers. Paul Arizon, ten years with the Golden State Warriors. Al Bianchi, uh, ten years with the Syracuse Nationals, Philadelphia Seventy Sixers. Cliff Hagan, ten years with the St. Louis Hawks. Uh, Willis Reed, uh, only ten years with the New York Knicks. Of course, injuries kind of caught up to him a little bit. There, Bill Bradley, ten years with the New York Knicks. Unfortunately, Tom Borwinkle had ten years with the Chicago Bulls. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, that was, nobody He's wants a good to. passing the Ben. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah. Alan Lavelle, uh, <laughs> 10 years with the Houston Rockets. Uh, Joe Griffith, uh, 10 years with the Utah Jazz. Bobby Wanzer, uh, 10 years with the Rochester Royals. Uh, Dan Issel, 10 years with the Denver Nuggets. Russell Westbrook, I think this is interesting too. Our last two guys, uh, still active players. Russell Westbrook uh, entering his 10th year with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, and then 10 years for Marcus Saul in Memphis. I don't think yeah. the Marcus Saul thing is going to last all that much. I don't know about the Westbrook thing. He uh, right. he might be a guy that just becomes like a franchise legend where he just kind of hangs around forever. It'll be uh, interesting to see how that ends up playing out. Yeah, and actually, I believe those guys are both entering their 11th year. Oh, sorry, so, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I believe Conley's entering his 12th year. So uh, worth, worth noting slightly. Yeah, so getting a little bit closer there. All right, and now we're going to get uh, quickly into notable tenures with one team, even though they didn't play with a franchise. So notable tenures, this is players that had a long career with, with a team, but then didn't play their entire career with that franchise. So they ruined it by getting traded or, you know, or, or looking for better opportunities, those selfish, selfish people. But uh, we'll run through these guys cr- pretty quickly because we don't necessarily need to break down all the stuff about that. But uh, you have Dominique Wilkins. Uh, he spent 12 years in Atlanta before being traded to the Clippers. And then, of course, he would uh, bounce around after that. He would go to the Celtics, the uh, Spurs the Magic and a bunch of other places that we don't need to remember because yeah, Dominique Wilkins is an Atlanta Hawk. That's all we'll ever right. remember. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, the Clippers, unfortunately, yeah, they, they were not able to ruin Julius Serving, but they were able to <laughs> They did Wilkins, take Dominique so. from us. That's very sad. They did. Yes. <laughs> Blood-sucking leeches there. Uh, Robert yeah. Parrish, uh, 14 years with the Celtics, but of course started with the Golden State Warriors and then would move on to the Bulls and the Hornets and a few other teams as well. No, that was it, right? Just the Bulls and the Hornets? Yep, this is four. Yep, yep, this is four. Uh, Paul Pierce, 15 years with the Celtics. Ah, uh, could have been, but then he gets traded uh, for Kevin Garnett and a bunch of other guys and all that sort of stuff. Boston Celtics trade to the uh, Brooklyn Nets, which we're still <laughs> dealing with today. But then, of course, he goes to the Wizards. He goes to the Clippers uh, as he rounds out his career. So 15 years with the Celtics, so pretty good, but uh, not quite there. Uh, I don't know how we count Michael yeah. Jordan. 13 years with the Bulls, kind of. I don't know how we leave when a guy leaves and comes back. I mean, he didn't play for another NBA franchise, yeah. so I guess we should right. count the other years. Right. But, you know, either way, 13 years with the Bulls. Yeah, when we did it for um, Magic when he came back. Yeah. So I feel like that's fair to, to do it for Jordan. Yeah, yeah. and then apparently I, I was looking at Basketball Reference, and they say that Michael Jordan played for the Wizards, but I don't um, I don't remember that. So I'm just going to act like that didn't happen. So. Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> I, the, 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 the wizard. He didn't play the for the Washington, Washington Wizards. Wizards. Yeah, like, they, I didn't Washington know they had Wizards. a team. Yeah, no, they, there's no way that Michael yeah. Jordan was played for the Washington Wizards. So we'll just move on. Yeah, there. Washington Bullets, maybe. Yeah, but, maybe, maybe. Know, I, I don't. No, maybe. I, he played for the Bulls, not the Bullets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's maybe where that's you get mixed up. Yeah, yeah, there's no way right. he played for the Wizards. Yeah. So I don't know. Basketball reference. I'll, I'll, I'll add them and let them know that they've made some great mistake by putting Michael Jordan in some weird. Like he retired and then came back like three years later to play for the Wizards. Come on, get out here. That didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, some people try to tell me that there was a franchise called the Bobcats. I right. Mean, yeah. I, it's ridiculous. I don't. I mean, that, uh, yeah. That's like, it's got a lot of errors. Right, it's, it's, there's, you know, they, they're, yeah. they're run, they run hockey reference and football reference and college football. I mean, things get crossed. They get Wires mixed get up. Crossed. Yeah, yeah, sure. Things, things happen. It's, I, I get it. It's yeah, understandable. It's okay. Yeah. Bobcats. Yeah. Funny. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, but I know. Who <laughs> would even see the Bobcats? I mean, it's seriously. So dumb, yeah. What's the most ridiculous thing you could ever possibly imagine? <laughs> uh, Brad Davis, he has 12 years with the Mavericks. Uh, he was interesting, though, because he um, was drafted by the Lakers, 
um, and then went to the Pacers, the Jazz, and a few other teams before before kind of settling with the Mavericks and having a really good career. And then he stuck with the, the Mavericks, of course, for the last you know 12 years of his career, but yeah, bounced around a little bit before that. Uh, Alex English has 11 years on the Nuggets. Uh, Bill Lambeer, 13 years with Detroit. Kind of interesting here, because you... I don't know if I necessarily 100% remember this, but he was on the Cavaliers for a while, too. Uh, traded in 1982 yeah. from the Cavaliers to the Detroit Pistons. I feel like a lot of people probably don't know that. they He's so synonymous with Detroit that it's hard to believe that he was a Cavalier. He, he, he certainly was a Cavalier, <laughs> yes. Yeah, very early in his career, yeah, they, they traded. It was just a year or two after he was drafted. So, um, yeah, it was a, one of uh, many uh, dumb moves by the Cavs in the uh, early 80s. <laughs> yeah. You know. Not the best run team. No, yeah. definitely, definitely no. not. Yeah, when you have a rule named after your incompetent general manager, it's, it's pretty right. Things are going to work. Incompetent that way. owner, incompetent and racist owner. Yes, right? so, yes, that too. Yes, yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, Hakeem Olajuwon uh, apparently also basketball reference made an error and said that he played with the Raptors, but I also do not believe that. But uh, yeah, of course, uh, seventeen years with the Rockets would have been high on that list uh, we mentioned before, but then has his one year with the Raptors. So, wow, yes. wow. Uh, Chris Mullen, uh, 12 years to start his career with Golden State. Uh, then he would have one more at the end of his career for 13 total, but of course had a stop in Indiana along the way as well. Um, Derek Fisher, I, I, this is kind of weird too because he had 13 overall seasons with the Lakers, but in two different tenures, so I don't know how we classify that. I guess we can classify it the same way we classify all those, you know, in terms of how Mullen, how we classify him. But, you know, Derek Fisher obviously has 13 overall seasons with the Lakers, but moves it up with a few different, you know, he's with the Jazz for a few years, yeah. with the, the, the Mavericks and, Warriors. and, and yeah. the Warriors, yeah, and all those. Um, yeah, he really bounced around toward the end there, yeah. So, um, yeah, I I would not have expected that it would have added up to thirteen years. That's yeah, it seems like a lot. Yeah, to have. yeah, yeah, right. it definitely does yeah. seem like a lot for 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 Derek Fisher. So I was caught, I was kind of caught by surprise by that as well. It doesn't quite seem that. Uh, yeah, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, of course, has fourteen seasons in LA, his longest tenure, but of course, is also a Milwaukee Buck. You have heard of Kareem Abdul Jabbar. We don't have to talk about it anymore about him. Yeah. I don't think no. so. Um, yeah. Good, good player, Kareem. Uh, Dwayne Wade, very good. Yeah, uh, thirteen consecutive years in Miami. Uh, added one more last year, and then had some unfortunate runs in Chicago and Cleveland. So that, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're just. I, last I'm going to forget right? that he. Yeah, I. Yeah, I think <laughs> at some point in the future, I'm going to forget that he was a Cavalier and be like, oh yeah, he played for the Cavs. That's right. Yeah, that's going to happen. Like in five years. Yeah. Be like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The five ten year, yeah. like the retrospective of. If Dwayne Wade played for the Cavs. You won't believe it. You know, yeah. you won't. It'll right. blow your mind that a Dwayne Wade with hair played with for the Cavaliers. It's just like impossible yeah. to. Well, we'll probably make the joke about how it didn't really happen. Right, exactly. Times, in so, ten yeah. years, well, when we're right. mercifully, for some godforsaken reason, still doing this podcast, even though we're making millions from it at that point, so it's obviously why <laughs> right. we're doing it. Uh, but yeah, we'll be talking and making that exact same joke. So mark it on your calendars, sure. folks. In two thousand yeah twenty eight, mark it on your calendars. We will be making that joke at this time uh, in ten years. But uh, yeah. Kevin Garnett, 12 years with the uh, Timberwolves, came back for a year and a half, uh, the last two of years of his career, but of course goes to the Celtics and uh, the Brooklyn Nets as well. So doesn't all go with the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves. Patrick Ewing, 15 years with the Knicks, uh, and then of course he uh, played for the Sonics and the Magic, but there's no evidence of that, so we're just not going to believe that that happened either. So yeah, the uh, particularly sure. the Magic years, I'd like to just forget. Well, no, because he played in the, like, ah, those, yeah, they had like those horrendous red uniforms at the time, the Supersonics. Ugh. Oh yeah, I hate it. Seeing just yeah. like really depressed, <laughs> fat Patrick Ewing just sitting there with the red unis of the Seattle SuperSonics, just lame. But 15 years for him uh, in Knicks blue, but then he of course bounces around a few places. Mo Cheeks, 11 years with yeah. Philly. Um, eventually, in 1989, he is traded uh, to uh, the San Antonio Spurs. Goes to the Spurs, then goes to the Knicks, then from the Knicks to the Hawks, and then also plays with the Nets as well. So he kind of rounds out his career, kind of bouncing around, but has that 11 solid years in Philly to start off his career. Uh, for him, Clyde Drexler, 12 years in Portland, of course, before he goes to Houston and rounds out his career. Uh, Jerome Kersey, 11 years with Portland before becoming a journeyman. Uh, and a real big journeyman, too. Like, goes to the Raptors in the expansion draft, then the Warriors, then the Lakers, then the Sonics, then the Spurs, then the Bucks, and just a lot of places for unfortunate um, uh, Jerome Kersey. Uh, Sam Lacey, I believe this is the first time I, I think we've ever mentioned Sam Lacey on the show. Maybe you can remember a time that we did as well. But 12 seasons with the Kings franchise. Uh, interestingly enough, in three different spots. He starts out in Cincinnati, of course, follows them to Kansas City, Omaha, and then just Kansas City proper. Uh, and then missed Sacramento by about four or so seasons. So if he had just hung around for four more seasons with that franchise, he would have been in Cincy, Kansas City, Omaha, Kansas City proper, and Sacramento, which would have been quite the accomplishment for Sam Lacey. But unfortunately... Four years off yeah. for him. So. He'll have to just accept being one of the best players in front of his <laughs> Right, so. which is, you know, when you're in, like, Jason Thompson territory with that damn franchise. <laughs> oh, well, 
They have all those 50s and Oscar yeah, I know, they do have Oscar yeah, so, you're, right, yeah. you're right, you're right. You're right. You should give so, them the, yeah. the credit. But they also Jason Thompson. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've mentioned Sam Lacey before. But, we, but, we, uh, okay, good. I'm glad. For the record, yes, we have, we have mentioned him. Uh, not, 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 maybe we could mention him more. We probably need to, we probably need to delve in a little bit more. He's an interesting player. Another good passing big man. Uh, Tony Parker, 17 is with the Spurs. I really just hope that like something goes wrong and he just never plays with the Hornets because I just oh, I saw that. Wow. No, I don't. Nothing, nothing wrong for him. I just maybe the Hornets are just like you know what, sir. Here, take 20 million dollars and, bad, and go know, yeah. sit on a beach and drink wine. Like that's much more right. enjoyable to you because they're already tweeting out pictures of of Tony Parker in a Hornets uniform and it's icky and I don't like it. And it just would have been great. 17 years of the Spurs would have put him very high on that list that we had talked about before. It would have given the Spurs a sure. ton of more players in this. But Tony Parker has to go ruin it by playing with the damn Hornets. So I get it. I understand. But, you know, it is what it sure. is. So is Tony Parker I, I, historically the greatest player to ever be a Hornet? Oh, wow. Because um, they're really probably the only two players that I can think of that would compete with it would be Alonzo Mourning and um, Rara Parrish. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, you got Zoe. Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, it is between those three. I'm, I'm kind of zoning in on uh, Alonzo Mourning and Tony Parker. I think Alonzo Mourning is probably a more dominant player, but I think Tony Parker probably had more... Uh, yeah, who was greater all time between Alonzo and Tony Parker? That's tough because you would seem like... I think most people would just kind of say Alonzo, but I think that does a great disservice to Tony Parker, who was fucking awesome for... for right. Quite a few years, so that's that's a really good question there. Right. I mean, Alonzo was a legit MVP candidate for a couple years. Right, um, right, but right. But obviously, was his career was cut short, you know, for... So if you talk about overall contributions, that, that's getting, kind of getting into hazy territory on longevity versus, you know, peak impact. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It just occurred to me when, when he signed there. I'm like, oh, I, I wonder you know, who you would uh, you would say on those lists. I, I remember you know, Michael Parrish over Parker too. I mean, Parrish was yeah, a top oh, of course. player. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. So I don't know. It is one of those three guys. I perhaps listeners can uh, share you know their uh, thoughts on the uh, matter as well. Uh, t- tweet us at over and back NBA or uh, our Facebook group as well. Either way, um, we'd love to hear your your input on it. Yeah, or that's, anything else you want to talk about? I don't about. know if I can come up with it. I, that's a really tough question there because I love Zoe and like you said, he was a dominant player for quite a few years. But Tony's just got the longevity. I don't know. It's that's really fascinating there. Yeah, I'm interested in what you guys say. Uh, to that. Definitely answer that question for us because I cannot come up with a decision. So maybe our fine folks can can settle the debate for us. Uh, two more guys here. We got George Gervin, 12 seasons with the franchise. But, of course, in 1985, is traded by the Spurs to the Chicago Bulls uh, and then plays out the strings of his career with the Chicago Bulls. But 12 years with George Gervin and the Spurs, I, again, really wish he had not gone to the Bulls because that would be awesome to have Gervin at 12, Parker at 17, Ginobili where he was, Duncan where he was, Robinson where he was. It's just like the Spurs. Because like, all the other franchises we talk about are these, like, what I would really consider the legacy franchises in the NBA, the Lakers, the Celtics, the, the, the 76ers guys like those and then to have you know the Spurs be as and, and they are I mean the, the Spurs are you know it might take a few years until we kind of realize it they are a legacy franchise in the NBA I mean they've been really good for a lot of years we've talked about it before the 50 win streak is incredible the playoff streak is incredible the stuff they've had and they've been good almost from the moment they joined the NBA and sh- even in the ABA as well so they're maybe not at that point quite yet or, but they probably should be but it's just interesting to see them almost dominate that list in terms of guys just hanging around there and, and you would never think San Antonio would be this place where people just end up spending almost their entire careers with but they do and it's not just a recent thing too george gervin kind of sets the standard there with 12 years with the franchise yeah absolutely and yeah the end not so good you know going to the bulls no. and uh think things are not going great there and there, there being some issues there but i think all was uh forgiven after that so uh obviously yeah and he a really fun player to watch too and and, and really like his peak you know he was like a all nba first team guy like four years in a row or four out of five years or whatever i mean he was really you know he, he was the best shooting guard in the game for you know a significant amount of time and um you know the era that he got stuck in um, isn't as fondly remembered as some other eras, but he was absolutely you know super important player and obviously important in Spurs history. Yeah, absolutely. And then our final guy here, Carl Malone, who went and ruined it. He had 18 season in Utah, established quite the career, and then has one year with the Lakers. Womp womp. <laughs> so he just yeah, right would have been high on the yeah. list, but. Didn't I get, get it. Ring. Well, he's high. He, he's high on this list. I guess he's high so on this on list. The, uh, he wanted the rings. Yeah. I get it. You know, yeah. things happen. They almost got there. Then things didn't yeah. happen, and then he was gone. Exactly. 
So I've we'll, we'll close on this uh, question. Where does Carl Malone rank among all time great players who have played for the Lakers? We'll, we'll include oh, wow. LeBron yeah, in this you're right. since, okay. he, since he hasn't played. Yeah, you're right. It just seems so weird to have this question and, and phrase it in Carl Malone territory. But I mean, Carl Malone is 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 one of the best to ever play. I mean, I right. I'd put him below Kareem. Okay, I'd put him probably below a Magic. Right. I'm going to get a lot of shit, but I'd have him in the conversation with a Kobe. I know Kobe stands are <laughs> feverishly okay. typing, but I think Carmelo okay. is a pretty fucking great all-time player. I I would say somewhere in that, that Kobe range. I think he's probably a little bit above Jerry West, even though Jerry West had an incredible career. I think he's a little bit above uh, at Elgin Baylor. I don't know where to put with the George Mikan just because it was almost a completely different era. Uh, for sure. basketball, what about, what about Shaq? Oh, fuck that Shaq too! God damn it, I forgot about Shaq and Wilt. Oh, Wilt. Wilt. Okay, never mind. Okay, all right. Um, this that's not fair. How did the Lakers get this many good players? That's they, they should, have, and they have yeah. LeBron now too. What the fuck? No, that's, they're right. not allowed to do yeah. that. They're not allowed to do that. They can't have these yeah. many good players. They need to share the wealth. Ah, uh, oh, shit! I forgot about LeBron. LeBron's in the Lakers. Jason, did you remember that? I, I do remember that. Yeah, oh. I, I heard that. It, it, it happened. God, yeah, he's so, got to be fifth so, then, right? Like around five, fifth, six, which sucks because it's Carl Malone. Like he's, you know, right. Man, he's like a top 20 so, player. So, but yeah, it's. Yeah, I mean, he's so he's behind Kareem. Yeah, he's for sure. behind LeBron. Yes. Um, he's, I, I would say he's behind Magic. Yeah. Uh, behind Shaq. Mm-hmm. Um, behind Wilt. I would put him behind sure. Wilt. Yeah, and I think that's okay. where I would then comfortably put so him. So that would be, that would be sixth. sixth. But and, then and there's then, arguments yeah. made. Then there's, you know, Kobe there's arguments, Kobe. Jerry West and arguments. West. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe even Baylor, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's tough. God, that's, man, uh, yeah. that's not fair. Lakers, no, that's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> you got to give some of those guys. You're not uh, allowed to have LeBron. Uh, you got to trade LeBron. You're somebody, not, you can't have him. Yeah. <laughs> somebody else uh, who you have to think about, uh, Steve Nash. Oh, right. <laughs> Probably not as good as Carl Malone, but he's like you know. Um, what about Dwight Howard? Like you know what I mean? Like we always gotta laugh about Dwight oh, Howard, but yeah, like right. Dwight's That's a weird true. one. Like right now he's he's a yeah. laughing stock, but I mean Dwight Howard's fucking great. Like he's really good. He's right. like yeah, the tenth peak. best Laker yeah. of all time. Like you know, like yeah, maybe fifteenth, but yes, <laughs> right, but, right, but still, yeah, 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 yeah. right. It, it's crazy. Yeah, he's a guy who was a MVP candidate. You know, so Stupid yeah. Lakers. Anyway, Stupid no, Lakers. it's. Uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's some fun fun thoughts there. What, a, so, what uh, an experiment there! That is that'll be our next fun episode to do. Is best Laker player of all time? We're just all we do is just upset Kobe player uh, Kobe stands by putting him like far below these sure. guys. But it's like come on, nice. uh, yeah, I, I would put Kobe maybe one ahead of, of Carl, but, but I, it's like right, like you know, it's it's very very yeah close. yeah. Like, yeah. I would, no, I, I yeah, could I could hear arguments both ways. To like I probably yeah. prefer Malone, but if you told me you had Kobe above him, I wouldn't argue with you. That much, sure. I probably would prefer Malone a little bit, but yeah, it's that's tough. It, that's it's tough it's super close. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully, I gave everyone some uh, food for thought. Feel free to tweet us your uh, all-time greatest Lakers or any other team for that matter. Uh, you know, you're, you, you now in the spirit of all-time greatest player to play for that uh, franchise because that, that would be more interesting than you know the the other way. But nevertheless, uh, you can you can find us. Um, you can find us at the step back at fansided.com. Um, you can also uh, find us on Twitter and Facebook at over and back NBA. Feel free to share anything you want with us. Uh, leave us a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you listen to your podcast. We're probably there and we'd appreciate your uh, feedback. So uh, thanks for listening and we're back again soon.